Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar and our first webinar for 2021. So my name is Mitchell Bowden. I'm the Manager of Engagement and Impact within the Knowledge Translation and Impact Team here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting. In Melbourne, the traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today. So today's webinar is going to be a little bit different um, in that we're running our last webinar from 2020 again, Families and Food, Identifying and Responding to Food Insecurity. But we're adding in some role plays to provide examples for practitioners working with families who may be experiencing food insecurity. The catch is that we won't be having a live Q&A session today, but the upside is that all the questions from last year's um, webinar are incorporated into this broadcast and the transcript and links to the recording are all available as well. So for a quick recap, in 2020, CFCA did a deep dive into food insecurity. We produced a research paper looking at what the data tells us some of the different experiences of food insecurity in Australia can be. A practice guide for professionals working with children, families and communities across a range of different settings. And this guide gives strategies and tips on how you might identify people who are food insecure and then what supports they might be linked in with. And then a short article on the experiences of food insecurity for Australian women and children affected by domestic and family violence. All of these resources are now available on the CFCA website and on the event page for this particular webinar. The presentation you're about to watch contextualises food insecurity first as a public health concern, uh, then through the experiences of on the ground professionals and services providing emergency food relief. And then finally, from the perspective of practitioners working with families experiencing food insecurity in other health and, health and social services. What we've added to today's webinar are two examples, role play examples of how practitioners can include questions regarding food insecurity into a session with a client. Firstly, when a client may present with health or social needs, or when a client might present explicitly in need of emergency food relief. So I'm now going to hand over to myself um, to continue introducing today's presenters. Today we're joined by Dr Sue Cleave, a senior lecturer in public health and nutrition at Monash Uni. Um, and she's also the, the convener of the Australian Household Food Security Research Collaboration. So Sue's research focuses on the existence and experiences of food insecurity, strategies to prevent it and pathways out of it. She's also an accredited practicing dietitian with over 20 years experience in health and community settings. And also Sue and, and a couple of her colleagues from the research collaboration worked with us on the paper and the practice guide that I mentioned earlier. So welcome Sue. Um, Thanks, as the general manager of business and at Food Bank Australia, our next presenter Sarah Pennell oversees Food Bank's uh, research portfolio, which includes the annual publication of the Food Bank Hunger Report. For those who aren't familiar with these reports, the most recent edition has some really insightful findings on the impact of COVID-19 on food insecurity. And we're gonna to touch on some of these today, but you can also find the report on the CFCA website and Food Bank's um, website as well for later reference. So hi, Sarah. Um, and lastly, Margaret is part of the assessment and response team at Gippsland Lakes Community Health, focusing on child family, sorry, child first, family violence outreach and intake. She's a social worker with 15 years experience um, in national and international settings, working with children and families, including working abroad in child protection services, in managing an alcohol and drug prevention service, and working with culturally and linguistically diverse um, communities and facilitating national prevention initiatives and workforce development. So hi, hi Margaret, welcome to you. Hi, hi everyone, thank you. <laughs> so now I'm going to hand over to Sue, who's our first presenter, and she's going to, to set the scene for us with a bit of an overview of what we know about the link between food um, and financial hardship. So over to you, Sue. 
Thanks Mitch. Uh, hi everyone. So before I start I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people of the Coolins Nation on whose land that we're all meeting today and I wish to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So in this very short space of time I really want to go through kind of like a bit of a what we know, what we need to know and what do we need to do. But as a starting point, there's a couple of key points that I want to stress on, which is, is uh, certainly available in the papers. So one is around our definition of food and nutrition security. So in essence, it's about regular, reliable, um, physical and social economic access to uh, enough food that's nutritious and culturally relevant to meet dietary and needs and food preferences. And because this is a basic fundamental human right, we also need to ensure that it's acquired in a socially acceptable way. So that's without resorting to emergency food supplies, scavenging, stealing and other coping strategies. So it's really important, there's key elements to this definition that are around, um, that support, I guess, our, our direction of our responses. The other point that I want to make is there's, when we hear statistics around food insecurity that quite often we can't compare apples with apples. So it's really important that we um, consider, you know, how the data was um, gathered, uh, who it's specifically looking, what was the tool that was measured. So we do know that from representative um, surveys by the ABS, so the Australian Bureau of Statistics, that approximately 4% of our population um, are experiencing food insecurity. But for many of us, we know this is much higher. Other measures, again, of a representative sample are around 13%, but we know that in some groups of the population, it is significantly much higher than that. Um, so with that point, it's also important, um, and this is some uh, evidence that's come out of Canada, that it's also really important that we look at, um, I guess, you, uh, you know, measures around or reports where, you know, statistics around usage of um, food relief, that they don't become proxy measures of household food insecurity. Because um, what we do know, and I'll talk about in a moment, is that it really can underestimate the actual number of people experiencing food insecurity, because it's really capturing those who are at that point of needing to source food relief. So we're essentially missing a large number of population who may be experiencing this issue. Um, and, um, and this is really important that we, um, from our policy-based responses. So the next thing that I really want to touch on and to draw your attention to is that food insecurity can have, well, there, there are many faces of food insecurity and there are groups of our population who are at greater risk. But certainly what COVID and um, other, you know, experiences that we've had in, in Australia, including bushfires this year, et cetera, have really exposed um, more faces or more Australians to this experience. But also what is seen as really highlighted the inequities that, we, that do exist in our country. So what does the experience of food insecurity re really look like? Well, in short, it's kind of like this continuum of experience that, um, you know, is um, going along in a severity. So what we do know is that um, what is seen as perhaps the milder version is about stress, anxiety, concern about putting food on the table, consuming perhaps less um, or inexpensive, less nutritious choices, making changes to the quantity and quality, skipping food, skipping meals, and then that severe experience of hunger, running out of food, unable to afford more, can't put food on the table, and reliance then on social supports and or emergency food relief. So people can actually slide across this continuum. So it may not necessarily be a static experience and they may be showing more than one of these experiences. The other thing to highlight is that this can be an episodic, so at different points in times for, for um, for households and for individuals, it can be chronic and ongoing entrenched experience um, that uh, people may be, um, 
you know, caught in this cycle um, for, for many, many um, years. And then there can be um, what we call the cyclical kind of um, experience, where it may be associated, say, perhaps with um, a certain time or point in a particular month when pay comes in, but then there's also a, a range of bills, et cetera, that come in as well. So that it becomes this cyclical experience, whereas the episodic may be related to, say, for example, a bill shock, as an example. So this is well documented, this kind of range of spectrum of experience that, that can really happen. And certainly this um, spectrum of experience, you know, I've um, certainly seen when I've talked to many people around this experience that you know, certainly that stress and anxiety is core to this experience as well. Um, the next part to, for us to consider, and I won't go into uh, a lot of detail around this apart from one element, and that's around the determinants or stresses of food insecurity. And in the paper on the website, it goes through what are kind of like the key dimensions of food insecurity. And one of those being, so those being around food availability, access and utilisation, but the stability over these of time. And I think what we would, with stability, that includes things like um, pandemics and natural disasters, which we are certainly experiencing at this point in time, and the natural disasters being things like bushfires and floods. So what I really want to focus on is what is the key driver of food insecurity? Um, and that is certainly linked to financial resources and um, material um, hardships as well. So while there is this inverse relationship between food, is food insecurity and income, using income alone as um, a potential marker is um, not necessarily is sensitive. So it's really looking at things like, as I said, financial resources, asset to debt ratio. There's um, literature to describe that if households have savings up to a couple of months, that can be in there, um, can actually be enough as a, a, a temporary kind of protector against the experience. But what things like, um, you know, income shocks, insecure um, employment, casualisation of employment, as I said, bill shocks, large household bills, something, you know, everything comes in at once, um, can certainly tip people into this experience. Now, one of, um, so, in Australia, I think probably um, Jeremy Temple from Melbourne University, he recently looked at um, some representative survey data by the ABS and in particular, one around the general social survey. And what he really focused on in, in this um, analysis was looking at the, the stresses uh, reported by food insecurity status. And what he highlighted within this, it's it's also things like health, um, so illness, um, mental health, uh, but also things that impact on financial resources. So around not able to get a job, loss of, um, um, of employment. But the other thing here, which I think is of interest and relevance to the paper that Mitch mentioned earlier, is the experience of violence or witness to violence um, as, as also a, a key determinant. And the other thing here is that quite often it's these determinants or these stresses that are stacked together that significantly impact on food insecurity. So with this, um, Jeremy Temple also looked at things like our social assistance payment. And it was really um, an interesting piece of work here, which he highlighted that again, looking at something, uh, data around the, called the Household Expenditure Survey, highlighting that those who are on student benefits, um, so OS study or AB study, uh, disability support pensions, and at that at this point in time when this analysis was done, it was still called New Start. So as we know now, it's called Job Seeker. Those, ha those people who are on this form of social welfare are significantly at a, a much higher risk of experiencing food insecurity than those that are on the age pension. So this was really important data for us here in Australia to hear about. So that's kind of, I really wanted to set the scene is that um, these stresses and um, around finance 
are significant tipping points for households. So what has happened in the light of what we've experienced in 2020? And I think what has certainly has um, we've seen is that food insecurity has worsened within economically vulnerable populations under COVID. So loss of income in already low income households really puts them at much greater risk. But what we've also seen is households who were not previously seen as economically vulnerable um, and previously food secure now tipped into this experience because of income losses. And I think early on we were seeing that um, households who had this suddenly had this heightened experience of economic vulnerability were then drawing on sort of finite unstable resources such as um, credit so using um, credit cards and superannuation to help to support their their household expenses so this then also um, creates certain um, certain um, issues with that as well so what do we know I mean is there any data well um, I there's one particular study um, during COVID that's happened in Australia um, that is currently in the literature and that is by a team from University of Tasmania led by, um, by Catherine Kent. And what this group were able to show was a representative survey across Tasmania and what they were show, able to show was the this gradient of impact that was apparent for respondents who lost income as a result of COVID, where if an income loss of 25% um, or more significantly increased the odds of food insecurity. And what they did find is that independent of other factors, including household income, a loss of more than 75% of income was associated with um, around a sevenfold increase of risk of food insecurity. So what has happened uh, in terms of response? And so I'm going to particularly focus on um, the federal responses around the coronavirus supplement uh, and uh, the job keeper and the job seeker. So what has this meant for households? Just as another example, there's been some work by um, Mandy Lee and Merrin Lewis from University of Queensland. So using a tool that actually measures um, the cost and affordability of food and you can actually look at it for a healthy diet. Now, previously we know that anything that um, it's across a standard basket of food, that affordability, uh, anything around 30% of income for is deemed as being unaffordable and food stress at around 25% of income. So what they were able to show using this basket and showing the impact of some of the, um, the federal responses to the coronavirus was that actually potentially made um, the, the, the access or the economic access to um, healthier food slightly more attainable um, by, by and shifting people from that, uh, you know, that, uh, let's say that, that food stress and, and really having difficult to afford it to potentially being able to afford it. And this was also supported by some recent work by, um, uh, Australian Council of Social Service. So ACOS um, prepared a report where they highlighted across a number of factors the impact around the coronavirus supplement across a number of people um, receiving social welfare. And what they were able to show was this measure really enabled people to purchase nutritious food, they were able to afford fresh fruit and vegetables, you know, prior to um, Prior to the, the supplement, 60% of those surveys, and we're looking just under a thousand people, um, reported that they didn't eat fresh, fresh produce and were skipping meals. And so it made significant, it's shown to make significant changes, particularly around people's access to, um, to food, in particular fresh fruit and vegetables as well. So that's really just as a highlight of what we've seen as, as a measure and what has happened. And I think what we'll hear through the rest of this um, webinar is potentially around things that what we can do um, and um, across working across this sector. But also I think it's 
for all of us is our role as advocates around um, key things that are really going to make a real difference uh, around not only the, 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 you know, importantly, the prevention of food insecurity, but also in terms of bringing people out of this long-term, you know, potentially a long-term experience. So that's it from me. So thank you, Mitch. And I'll hand over to Sarah. Um, I'm going to corroborate a lot of what Sue uh, has already said to you. I um, have uh, uh, been listening and uh, a lot of what she has already highlighted has come through in our own research. I work for Food Bank. We're the largest food relief organisation in Australia. And for the past eight years, we have been producing a hunger report, uh, basically taking a look at food insecurity in Australia. Um, in 2020, that report is somewhat different to previously, um, because obviously the year has been very much a year of two halves. Um, and at the time of doing our research, the six months of COVID had really kind of uh, thrown everything up in the air. Um, and so our research this year has just looked at the COVID experience rather than being a, 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 a general snapshot of the whole year. So um, what I can say is that uh, uh, food insecurity in the time of COVID has been very erratic and unpredictable. Um, that said, overall though, uh, on average, demand for food relief has been up by about 47%. But at different times, um, that figure has, has oscillated between up nearly 100% to then down to below 30%. And that's all been around um, what's been happening uh, with things like government support. So as soon as um, the coronavirus supplement and JobKeeper and JobSeeker kicked in and people had money in their pockets, Again, um, those people that had sought food relief for the first time when uh, ISO hit and people lost their jobs, they were able then to, to manage for themselves. But that said, since September, uh, when the first uh, rollback of the support started, um, we have seen demand for food relief climb again and in fact, up a further 28% since the end of September. And talking to charities, they believe that they're going to see double the number of people over Christmas than they did last Christmas. Um, and they have even greater fears for uh, uh, post January when there will be further uh, rollback of the support, the government support packages. So, um, we at Food Bank believe that we actually haven't seen peak hunger um, in this COVID pandemic. Uh, we believe that the economic recovery phase is actually going to be uh, far more uh, of a concern when it comes to something like food security. But let's unpack the kind of people who have been experiencing food insecurity uh, during COVID. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, there's a number of, of things going on. First of all, those people who were previously food insecure, so those who had been experiencing chronic food insecurity, um, have suffered even more. And I think Sue mentioned this. What we've seen is that um, those Australians uh, who were already seeking food relief before COVID are now actually seeking food much more frequently than previously. And um, uh, in 2019, it was about 15% of those seeking food relief sought it more than once a week. And now we're seeing 30%. Um, the other group is a completely new group or a completely new uh, a variety of, of, of groups. Three in 10 of those experiencing food insecurity during COVID had never experienced it before. Um, and charities are seeing a significant number of two particular groups. One is casual employees and the uh, other is international students. 
And I think we're familiar with that because there's been quite a bit of media about international students. And in the case of both groups, it's largely because they are ineligible for the government support. Another point I wanted to make is that um, a higher proportion of people experiencing food insecurity for the first time during COVID are women. So about 60% of all those people experiencing uh, food insecurity for the first time are women. So while the government assistance such as JobKeeper and JobSeeker have provided vital temporary relief, 62% um, of uh, food insecure people say they are not receiving uh, the, all the assistance they need. And a fifth, as I've said, are actually completely ineligible for the assistance. Another trend that's worth noting is that it's the young Australians who have been hardest hit during COVID. When it comes to uh, uh, you know, experiencing hunger because of the pandemic, um, young Australians are the ones at the forefront. This is reflected in that 65% of food insecure uh, 18 to 25 year olds are going without food at least once a week. That is significantly more than any other age group. Amongst baby boomers, for instance, it's, it's only 25%. The other thing I wanted to mention is there are grave fears for the future. Um, we asked food insecure people to look forward and almost 35% of them said they don't know whether they will cope or expect that they won't cope when the additional government support is withdrawn. Um, charities believe that uh, demand will increase over Christmas, as I've already said, and then again when uh, uh, the assistance is rolled back and they are telling us that they would need at least 50% more food in order to be able to um, uh, cope with the demand. Sue made the point that we shouldn't use uh, numbers related to people seeking food relief as a proxy for food insecurity, household food insecurity. She's absolutely right. Um, what we've seen in our research is that um, 61% of food insecure people actually access food relief, which means about 40% aren't. Um, and when we unpack that, what we find is there's a variety of reasons why they don't, but quite often those reasons are um, relate to embarrassment and shame. And this is the case under normal circumstances, but even during COVID, when we know um, that everybody's being affected equally and, you know, genuinely people could not have predicted that they were going to lose their jobs in the way they did uh, overnight as happened during uh, the lockdowns, they still are not keen to reach out for help but believe that, you know, it's embarrassing or, or it's their fault that they uh, don't uh, have the wherewithal to put food on their table. So that's a big issue and one that we really need to address. Um, that's all I wanted to share today. I know we're going to have an opportunity a bit later um, to take questions, but I'm now going to hand over. Thank you, Sarah and Sue. Um, I work in uh, East Gippsland, which is in regional Victoria, in uh, Gippsland Lakes Complete Health. And what I will do during this time is um, focus a, a little bit about the clients we are seeing and the problems they are presenting to us um, in our practice. So in regional Victoria, we have experienced first the drought and then um, a national disaster of the fires, the bushfires that started the year, and then the pandemic. So the clients that are presenting to us are very, very much hit in the financial situation because of the pandemic, because of COVID-19, because of resulted in, uh, less um, income, lack of income, and also lost jobs. So if they maybe had part-time jobs that was giving them a little bit more income, stability in their, in their lives or in their families, now they've lost even that. It could be a full-time job, but even those who are relying for, 
for a little bit extra income, um, many of them have lost that resource as well. So what, um, what they present like um, are sometimes occasional clients. So sometimes they come because occasionally they're experiencing food insecurity and this might be because of an accident um, an extra medical bill um, that they have because um, of something happening in their health or else um, their car breaks down and it's an extra expense that they did not um, foresee um, you know and other situations like that which which is not their usual pattern so they um, experience just an a one-off uh, situation where they're really struggling and then they come to us and say look I'm really struggling can you help me um, and they might ask for for food which can be quite embarrassing for them especially if they have been managing before but we also have others who maybe have are experiencing food insecurity because of other underlining issues so sometimes there could be an addiction to substance abuse or even gambling that is leading them to mismanage their funds and putting maybe the, fun the funds in the wrong priority and then um, they don't have funds for the food or else on the other way um, they might be um, focusing on prioritizing food for the for the family or for themselves but then they are neglecting bills and then they end up having difficulties with paying their rent and sometimes they risk eviction so the the problem of food insecurity is not part and parcel on its own there's usually other complex issues around the food insecurity issue that they present um, sometimes there's family violence situations as well and so the the, the person that needs to leave the family violence uh, environment has to seek alternative accommodation and that can be an added strain um, in the finances sometimes they cannot access their their finances for a while as well um, and they present to us but that would be again an occasional situation um, i think as professionals, sometimes we are um, a bit reluctant in exploring the financial situations with clients. We might have, um, from a professional side, uh, we might actually feel that we should not probe in that area because it's a private matter. However, we have noticed that when we have clients who have presented um, asking for food regularly, it has been very beneficial to sit down with them and actually explore a little bit what's happening in their finances. So we do ask those probing, uncomfortable questions of when is your centering due, um, how much income do you actually get, and uh, what has happened during these last two weeks, uh, where has your money gone, but of course in a very sensitive manner so that the client does not feel uh, intimidated or, or um, you know or closes off to give us that information mm -hmm. but by asking those questions if we ask it in a sensitive way and in a caring manner the client might actually be in a position to open up about other issues that they need help with they might be able to be linked into counseling um, they might be able to be linked into specialized services for addiction for their addiction issues there might be family violence that comes out through that conversation um, so or other um, abuse situations that is occurring that is leading to the financial instability and need for food insecurity so um, it's really good to have that question and um, do it in a very sensitive way so um, we sometimes focus on assessing the big problems so let's say we're, if we work in child first um, we want to work with parents and we want to address parenting skills and and the other issues around the parenting. However, if a parent is struggling to put food in, on the table, sometimes if we manage to actually address that need before we address the other bigger problems, the client might be more inclined to open up and receive our suggestions because the first, I mean, if you are a, a mom, for example, and you, you cannot provide food for your children, that is the biggest problem that you need to be tackling um, before you are tackling anything else. So clients seem to appreciate when we actually address um, financial instability and food insecurity as one of our assessment um, 
things that things that we assess so they really appreciate that and sometimes open up to want to receive other things as well other services and other supports um, I think it's very important as well for um, organizations and for social workers to be aware of um, non-government organizations around their agency that provide food. So if you're working within an agency where you do not have uh, food packs to give to clients, you can actually um, have resources around you that you can link clients to or um, liaise with. For example, we do that in our work. Um, we have a non-government organization that provides us with food bags for clients and we make sure that they are um, food which is specifically for the need of the client so whether it's a homeless person or whether it's a, um, a family the, the needs for food would might be different if somebody doesn't have a, ho a house on their um, on their on their head um, they might actually still need food and but they won't be able to cook that food. So we're also we need also to be um, aware of our clients' needs, and we can only be aware if we do those conversations with the client. If a client comes and we just give a food bag and not dwell further, uh, we might be missing out opportunities to be able to reach out to those clients. Um, so it's very important that we tackle that issue, maybe to think about also sensitively including it, including food insecurity as part of our assessments with clients, and also to be aware of clients that present to your agency and the different um, situations that they come from and how that might be leading to the food insecurity. So that's all from my part, and I hand over back to Mitch. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Margaret. Um, and equally, thank you to, uh, to Sue and Sarah so far. Um, and that's a really great segue, actually, into the next, um, next part of this webinar, where we are actually going to look at this idea of screening or incorporating um, some, some sensitive screening questions into, um, into your existing intake or assessment um, forms, or even if you're not working in a client-centred way, um, even just in some discussions, some, some discussions that you might be having with communities um, or individuals or families. So um, we are going to look at some of those things. And first, I might just um, ask Sue to come back on. Um, and she's going to, I guess, just give us a quick overview of what, um, what screening questions are available to us. Um, and the, these are available in the practice guide that I mentioned earlier um, that's, on, that's on the website and also available in the handout section. Um, but don't worry if you don't have it in front of you because Sue's going um, to just quickly introduce those to you and, and tell us why they're important and how they can help you help your clients. Great. Thanks, Mitch. Um, so I think, you know, the first question, I think, Margaret, you know, the segue has been fantastic because um, why screen it is really important because one of the things that we haven't touched in but is really well described within the, the practice papers is um, food insecurity the ultimately has impacts for both adults and, and children in the short term and the long term around physical, social and mental health as well. So it is really important that we, we do actually screen for it um, and um, have those discussions. So what can we use? So um, in the practice paper we actually have um, the, uh, I guess a, a tool that has been relatively newly validated and it's built on um, a tool from the US uh, from the US Children's Health Watch and it's called Hunger Vital Signs and it's a two item screener. Um, so a team from uh, Queensland Uni University of Technology, so um, Danielle Galagos uh, and um, team have actually taken this tool and it's done some preliminary validation of this with some modifications in an Australian context. And so they've done this um, uh, within a paediatric um, healthcare context uh, and as well as in a regional um, context in an outpatients kind of setting um, while people were waiting for appointments. And what this tool really does, I think, you know, you get the picture that through across our presentations, 
this experience, as we've talked about, is not just about that end stage of experience, about running out of food, not having enough money for food, but it's also centred around that worry, concern, stress around, will I run out of food before you're, uh, that we're able to buy more? Um, so these are essentially the two screening questions and these can actually be built into your assessment um, that you're uh, doing with clients uh, or as people as um, you, you see them so that they can actually be threaded through the conversation and yes there is stigma um, and I think that's something that we have all alluded to around Food is something that, you know, we all, um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, people, have, you know, particularly parents and particularly mothers, there's that stigma and that shame of, I don't want to say that I can't feed my children or, you know, we're really struggling with, with, with food. But the question can actually be asked, particularly as a starting point is, you know, have you ever been worried about that? And so in terms of this screener, we've got those two questions there. And there, um, and in responses, it's been phrased as something that's never true, sometimes true, or often true. So if we get people who respond never true to both of those questions, then they are on the continuum as what we would describe as their food secure. But I guess the thing is also to, to highlight that these are, are screening questions um, and an assessment of whether the people are at risk or potentially experiencing. For those that may, um, then respond sometimes true to either or either one of those questions, then certainly they may be uh, at that, uh, if we think back to that spectrum, perhaps on that, um, the, the early stage or some of the earlier kind of experiences um, where um, people may not be progressing further up to that continuum, but certainly is serious um, you know, potentially at risk of progressing further. And then there's often true where people are uh, responding to both of those questions. So they would be described as um, certainly if they've said, responded to that they've run out of food um, in both of these um, highlights then of these questions, then they are certainly deemed to be experiencing food insecurity and on that continuum more that severe sort of um, uh, spectrum. So I think the thing is, is both these questions can be threaded through um, and the assessment and threaded through the conversation um, as, as uh, when we're facing clients that, um, and as Margaret sort of mentioned that, you know, food insecurity is really um, potentially a marker of, an, of a range of multiple stresses um, that are going uh, people are experiencing in their day-to-day -day lives. So I think now we're going to go back to Mitch and then we'll um, talk about those in more detail. Thank you, Sue. So before we head back to the panel, this is where we're going to show you our two role play examples. And again, these are of practitioners incorporating screening questions into discussions with clients, either as clients presenting with emergency food relief needs or with other health and social needs. Hi, thank you for coming in today for the appointment. Um, I called you to come in today because I wanted to talk to you about a referral from Child First um, that we've received, um, um, suggesting that you might need support. I don't understand why I'm here. Okay, and I understand you can be a bit confused because um, you wouldn't know who has done this referral. Is that what worries you? So basically we've received a referral saying that you have two children, is that right? Yes. Um, and that you have mental health issues and you might be struggling a little bit about that. Can I ask who the referral was? It was an anonymous referral, but um, they said that they, you have kids and you have mental health and that you might be struggling a little bit and some parenting support might help you. 
So I'm really uncomfortable with that because, you know, normally people get involved and causes problems and I don't want anybody to take my children away from me. Can you tell me a little bit more what you mean by it causes problems and the children will be taken away from you? I don't really want to share my personal life with anybody. Okay. Have child protection ever been involved with you? No. no. And what do you mean by um, you're afraid that children will be taken away from you? Well, when people start asking questions and they get involved in your life, accidents can happen, things can go wrong, people can make bad decisions. I understand your fear, but what I can reassure you about is child first role is different than that. So child first aims at trying to give you support to the parents to actually care for your children. Um, we don't have the authority to remove your children. That is something child protection can do. We do, yes, feedback information to child protection if we feel there is the need. But if we do that, usually we discuss that with you and we explain that we are concerned. So our aim is not to actually contact child protection and say uh, how bad a parent you are, but actually it's to try to empower you as a mom in whatever struggles you have at the moment for your kids. Does that um, mean anything to you? Are these people parents well, themselves? Like, I mean, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm trying to do a really good job, just under really difficult circumstances. Yeah. Whether the professionals that work with us are parents or not, it's, it's not important because they give the same support to any parent. So they can... They won't do decisions for you as a parent. We also understand that you as a parent are the best person who can take decisions for your family. So it's not about whether they're parents or not. I believe they can still try to understand you if you allow us to give you support. But it's something that is voluntary. This is not something you are forced to engage with. It's something that um, can be an additional support for you if you want it. I'm not sure. Okay, so let me give you a bit of an understanding of some of the services that we have here. So there's a lot of services like counselling, parenting supports, family violence, outreach supports, um, services for the children and young persons. So there's a variety of services that we offer as an agency. But I'm actually going to ask you something that some families that we encounter struggle with quite regularly with, which might be something that you might also consider. Um, have you, do you worry about uh, your food? Do you have food? Do always, you... always. So you feel that financially you struggle? Mm. Okay, okay. And that's okay to discuss even things like that because they're day-to-day -day struggles that you might have as a parent. So even basic things like that, we can discuss. So um, you're saying that you worry sometimes about food. What's your situation like this week for you? really difficult. Um, I don't have a lot of money, I'm not working and with the two children with the baby and my five-year-old um, I have to choose and make choices on a weekly basis between do I buy formula and nappies for the baby or do I feed my five-year-old and I I don't eat myself. I don't. And that's really concerning that you're not eating because you need um, to take care of yourself as well as taking care of your children. And I believe that can be quite stressful for you. It is very stressful. I've got um, I've got some other issues myself personally and and not eating makes makes it makes it worse. Can you tell me a little bit more about these other issues? Um, I have a postnatal depression um, which I struggle with um, and I'm diagnosed, but I'm not taking medication because I can't afford to pay for the medication. I understand. So this financial situation is affecting you in many different areas mm. in your life, both in your parenting, it seems, and also in your mental health. Um, what's uh, providing you with some food today and some food vouchers to buy some formula for baby help a little for this week? Mm. I'm not Australian born and in my family a mother who can't feed her children isn't worth much I and I, I can't talk to my family about that for that reason. I'm sorry about that you don't have support from your family. Um, what I can tell you although I'm not from your same culture and I wouldn't 
um, pretend to be an expert as well because you know your culture well. But what I can assure you from our side is that we offer you privacy and confidentiality and your family or relatives do not need to know um, that we've provided you with food. I need to make sure of that. That's really important to me. They can't know that I, because as a mum, you know, I feed my children, I feed my family, I take care of them. If I can't do that, they'll look down on me. Yeah. And um, you're not the only mum that struggles with providing food for your kids. We are meeting a lot of families who are struggling at the moment with mm -hmm. providing food. So it's not because you're a bad parent, it's a reality of the current situation. And I really actually appreciate that you uh, voiced your concern with me um, because at least we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. But then going back to what you told me about your family, I can reassure you that they cannot phone and know what services we're giving you. And also you don't need to tell them where you brought your food food from or that we've given you food vouchers um, because I understand it can be sensitive for you and I am and we respect you for that and we respect that you've been able to share it with us and if you allow us we'd like to help you with that. Okay, thank you. Would you um, accept food bags and food vouchers from us today? Would you want that? Yes. That would be good. Thank okay. you. We can also look a little bit on, on the long term to see how we can avoid um, this worry being something that is repetitive of not having food for yourself and your kids mm -hmm. and uh, maybe look at how that is affecting your mental health if you allow us to offer you support with child first. Okay. Is that okay? Do you feel a little bit better than how you start, um, we started um, this appointment? I've, I've, never, I've never reached out for help before but I'm, I'm glad that I came in today because it sounds like you might be able to help me. Okay. Okay. Um, I will be calling you again and would it be okay if I come visit you at home? Is that something more easy for you? Yes, if we can arrange a time when there'll be nobody else around, I'll definitely appreciate yes. that. Okay, yep. thank you for being so honest with me um, and we can assure you that we'll be very sensitive in, in how we provide you support. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, how are you today? How can we help you? I'm good, thank you. I've just come in today because I'm hoping that you might be able to assist me with some food because we don't have any left. Okay, so how many people are in the home? It's myself and my partner and our two children. Okay, how um, old are your children? One's two, one's five. That's good, that's good. And you're saying that you're finding yourself this week having more food? Yes. When is your next uh, payment? Do you have a job? Do you have something? No, I, I lost my job. I work in catering and um, we receive Centrelink payments, but um, it's been, I think we were paid last week. We've got another week to go. Mm. And it's really difficult to try to keep on top of everything. And I'm just hoping they might be able to get some food. Yeah, we can help you today. We do have. Um, food bags and food vouchers that we can help you with. It's just I'm trying to understand whether this is something that occurs often and whether you actually find yourself worrying about not having food for yourself and for the family regularly. I do, but there's nothing much that I can, can do about it because, you know, having lost my job, it's very difficult to um, pay the bills and the rent and sort of keep everything going. I have to prioritise and choose which which one to do. And does your partner work or is he also he, on No, he's also on job seeker as well. Okay. He doesn't work. And how does it go? Like, um, do you have other expenses that you are finding yourself struggling financially with? Um, well, we, we, we're, we've got the real estate agents on our back at the moment because we're behind. We're getting into arrears. We're about three weeks in arrears and they've already um, threatened us that they're going to evict us. And that would be quite stressful too. Oh, it's about. very stressful, very stressful. Mm -hmm. So you're three weeks behind in rent and when is your next Centrelink payment? Next week. Okay. And did you plan to try, do you have a plan on paying back the rent somehow with the agents or have well, you? Well, it's very hard to have a plan when you, you know, you don't know 
where your next dollar is coming from. Of course, I understand um, that. So yeah. It's like you're juggling every week. Isn't Con, it? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We do have food items, food vouchers that I provide you mm -hmm. with today. Um, I'm just concerned about this. Um, that you call threat about addiction, which mm -hmm. is very concerning as well. Would it help you if I try to see if we've got some funding to try to help you with the rent that you've got in arrears? Maybe you can find your feet a bit financially. I'm really worried that my husband um, finding out that I've actually come here because I think he might be a bit too proud to accept that kind of help and assistance. Okay, so okay. that's something I, I, you know, if it's something you can do, then I would probably talk to him about it, but I wouldn't talk to him first. Yes, definitely. You can talk to him about it and let me know whether we can help you with the rent and arrears. Mm -hmm. Look, we have a lot of supports and services here. Do you think there's something that we can provide you and your partner with that can help you maybe understand what the problem is that is leading to this financial struggle, apart from you not having a job? Well, when I when I get when I get another job in catering, it won't be as as hard as it is now because obviously I'll have a wage coming in, um, and it just we're not spending a lot of money on things that we shouldn't spend money on we're spending money on rent and food and things like that but um my husband has a bit of a drinking problem he's um you know he, he, he buys a lot of alcohol and that money goes towards the alcohol rather than food for the kids because yeah. we've tried to keep up with the rent then we pay the rent first but still three weeks in arrears but you know he's drinking I mean he doesn't help much with the kids either so mm -hmm. that makes it even more difficult and I see that you're expressing quite a bit of pain as well about that because you seem to be concerned about your children and mm. um, and maybe you feel that he's not um, seeing you the same priorities as the same as you. No, he doesn't. He's, yeah. yeah. So um, I'd like to give you an appointment because I'm aware that today you dropped in and asked for the mm. food, but would you? Would you be able to come and uh, have a bit of a more chat with us so that we can see whether we can offer you support, like you've said, and maybe also your partner, you know, if he wants support with his alcohol issue, eventually um, we can give him support as well if he agrees. I don't know that he would agree, but I, you know, I would appreciate being able to come back and, and see what you can do for us. Yes maybe giving you a bit of support in these struggles and also trying to understand you know what's going here because i see that you're a bit in pain maybe we can understand what happens um, when your husband drinks mm -hmm. um and whether there are other issues that we can give you support with okay thank you great thanks kim and margaret so now we're going to head back to the panel discussion and the q a session with all of our presenters I might ask um, Sarah and Margaret to join us again. Um, and really one of the one of the things that um, has been touched on um, throughout this presentation, but um, I think is worth exploring a little bit more as a panel is is this this idea of stigma and shame. And so in the practice guide, people will find um, that there's a, a series of FAQs or frequently asked questions that we've um, attempted to respond to a, to try and overcome some of these. And one of them I'm keen to, to discuss as a panel, and that's, um, you know, as a practitioner, if I was to, you know, to not feel sure about asking these questions, because, you know, I know my clients get uncomfortable and I worry that they might feel judged or embarrassed. You know, do I really need to include this in my intake? Um, and and what should I do if I do notice that either in their verbal responses or in their non-verbal cues, um, if I do notice that they're starting to feel uncomfortable or that they're indicating uh, in their body language something that um, might indicate that they are feeling food in, that they are food insecure, but their verbal response is saying, "No, I'm fine." Um, so Margaret, maybe could we could we get your perspective on that first, being um, being that this is something that you're um, familiar with in your practice. Yeah, so I think we need to be sensitive. And of course, although we want to probe to actually help clients, I think fundamentally it has to also portray care um, and that as an organization we can um, identify the specific needs so that we can offer the support. So that message needs to be highlighted. So we cannot just uh, do like a tick 
tick box kind of questionnaire with the clients to find out whether they have food insecurity because it is an embarrassing topic and it's not a topic that clients will just um, gladly admit to unless they are, are willingly coming to ask for food um, in their first response. So mm. um, we need to be sensitive, probe, but also uh, walk with the client. And if they don't feel comfortable, then we need to be able to stop and just see whether there are other resources that we can offer instead um, that might actually re release some funds for them to be able to then um, tap into food resources for themselves. So um, either we could... Um, if they present, for example, with an issue, um, I don't have fuel or I don't have a gas cylinder, etc., we can offer them food to release finances from the food um, expenses so that they can use that funds to um, use it for the other presenting issues that they've presented. And that sometimes leads to a more comfortable conversation of, oh, wow, thank you. Sometimes I have had these uh, challenges. Or else if they present wanting the food specifically, then it's more comfortable to have the conversation of uh, understanding more about the income and what's happening if it's a repeated pattern. So we need to always show care in our approach, of course. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah, also. also um, well, maybe Sarah will go to you first. Did you want to add anything to that? I, I would just add from uh, uh, another potential approach is to just ask them about their shopping habits and how well their kids are eating, um, you know, what kind of meals do they do at home, what do they give their kids to take to school. So you start asking from that positive perspective and then um, you know, where they're experiencing uh, difficulty or challenges in having enough food, it'll start to come out, but you don't start with that. You just talk about, you know, um, having to cater for a, you know, a growing family and how challenging that can be um, and work towards it, to, towards yeah. those greater, that greater understanding. Yeah, great one. And what about you, Sue? Anything yeah, to add? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it certainly is, it certainly is tricky, but I think it's also too, as we've sort of said, it's having that respect and coming with that care and that empathy. But also, I think in how we approach the question, so it may not be, um, we can we can sort of perhaps frame it of, you know, I come across lots of my clients who talk about, you know, this is an experience and, and you know, really struggling at times to put food on the table and, you know, um, provide school lunches or, or, or you know, as an example. Um, that can, you know, is this something that, um, you know, you're experiencing or you've experienced in the past. So it's it's taking away from that specific also focus on that individual and also mm. saying, look, hey, you know, I've come across this, see, you know, with lots of people that I've, I, I speak with and work with too. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're not, yeah. not alone. Yeah, yeah, you're not alone. Because I think that is a really good point. There is that sense of, I'm a failure. This is what I'm spoke. You know, my experience in 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 um, speaking with people in terms around their experience of food insecurity, particularly mm -hmm. women, there is that sense of failure because I think, uh, like as an example, I have one woman I can clearly clearly remember. She said, "This is my job. I'm meant to be able to feed my kids, and I can't do it." Yeah. Wow. Another response that we get quite frequently from our surveys is people saying, yes, I am struggling, but I'm sure there's other people who need it more than I do. Yeah, yeah. I agree, yeah. Sarah. And I think that's that sense of um, that people will hold on and struggle um, and perhaps, you know, as you sort of said, there's a whole group of people that are not, um, may not, you know, may, may not seek support or yeah. even support yeah. from family and friends. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is is definitely this importance of the rapport building and, and having a good relationship um, with your clients. And that and you know, and that may be difficult if you're not always working with the same client, but I think it's probably as a service organization worth considering um, you know, uh, there's these questions. Yes, they've been validated and, and yes and yes we know that they can lead to good um good conversations, but um it's worth 
it's worth thinking about where in the process with people that fits, whether it's at the point of intake or whether it's maybe a little bit later on and, and um, in, in um, various discussions at, or through inquiry it comes up. I um, think also, also Mitch, um, yeah, sorry. I think also um, they might actually be thankful if we ask the question. They might not have actually thought that they could um, ask that question. Maybe they're not aware that there's the resource or that the possibility of asking us that question. So they come to us for something else, maybe um, for yeah. counselling or or other things, and they might not identify that they can actually speak about food insecurity with us as well unless we ask so they might actually be very thankful that we have actually put that forward yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. so powerful if you do because um not having the, the the stress or concern about food in the household can free up time and energy and hope for addressing the other more fundamental issues you know yeah. that have brought them to that to that circumstance so yeah. The charities that we supply food to are always telling us that the food relief that they do provide is just so critical in building trust and and giving people the capacity to address address their other issues. Mm. Um, um, I, I, we've got one other one that we might get to um, in a little bit, but I do want to go to one of the questions that's come through from the audience, which I think is a really interesting one. Um, and so it's as a local government or community development worker, um, or public health, health promotion type of a role, how can we best support stakeholders to deliver food security initiatives and build capacity of individuals and groups in the community to increase their access to healthy and nutritious food through gardening, food banks and seed sharing and things like that. So I think it's really around, again, that, that notion of not working in a client um, focused service, but, but how can we work um, as a system so Sue, maybe did you have some perspectives on that firstly? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's well, I think what they're, you know, implying and leading to is that systems thinking. So really applying within that local system, that local government um, context, that broader system of um, food access. So looking at it um, quite broadly, so inclusive of perhaps um, food relief, but beyond that, so what are other things that um, within that local government and within all the, you know, the myriad of organisations that sit within local governments and community-based organisations and the connections, so I think that's really important, that to provide a very much joined up but a very uh, varied response um, to, to actually support access um, to food. And, you know, even within a local government context, like the power that they potentially have in terms of even looking at well what are the you know the, the the access points for people in terms of food so what are the fresh food outlets where are they do people do we have adequate public transport do we need transports you know transportation system to help you know if it's that food physical kind of um, access kind of um, point that we're doing as well yeah, so it's really looking at that system. Yeah. yeah. I think, Sue, think that's Mark... the big issue is that um, while food insecurity touches on so many um, areas of policy and, and, and you know, welfare response, um, be it social welfare, health, education, um, employment, you know, it, it, it touches on all these areas. Um, but it doesn't sit in in one area and so it falls between the cracks and i think one way of being able to get a better more systematic approach as sue said is to have be it at the local government level uh, uh, or you know right up to commonwealth government level have a food security strategy so actually look at food security in totality as it spans across all the other portfolios Mm. I think that's a good point. It's actually, it's interesting, this um, this touches on the point that Margaret, you made earlier around, um, you know, if you're not in a position in your organisation to be providing food vouchers or food hampers um, or even running community meals or lunches or things like that, um, 
you know, doing a little bit of that mapping of who else in, the, in your local system is, is doing what um, in relation to food. Or like Sarah said, it may not be that they're working in food at all, but they're working in um, employment services or, um, or um, you know, education. Um, so that actually links to this next question that we've got, which is um, given that the main drivers of food insecurity are related to, to financial resources and material hardship, um, for those professionals and organisations that are responding to food insecurity, so this might be our emergency relief um, or charity organisations, who should they be working with? So who, who can they, if they're starting from scratch, who can they be reaching out to to identify um, and work with? So Margaret, do you, did you want to um, maybe give your thoughts on that first? Yes, so um, we have actually linked with a local church um, in the community that wanted uh, their initiative to be uh, providing food. So they don't actually meet the client, they just do meetings with us and organize food packs for us, which is great. Um, so they provide that through their funding um, and they're reaching out to the community through that. Um, and of course, that provides us with resources to give to the clients. So I think it's very important to just keep, um, a, you know, a really wide um, perspective about where actually resources can come from, because uh, we might be focusing only on a few organizations that we know, but there might be other um, voluntary organizations um, also that would be willing to um, work with us to resource the clients. Yeah, yep. Sarah, did you want to add any of those? So you're nodding um, avidly. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, Margaret's absolutely right that help can come from all sorts of sources and COVID was an amazing example of that for us at Food Bank because uh, when we first, when food, uh, COVID first hit, a lot of charities, the normal regular charities that we were supplying closed because they had uh, uh, all the volunteers who needed to isolate themselves or they found it too difficult to adapt to the COVID safe uh, protocols, um, you know, changing perhaps from cooking hot meals to providing hampers was too difficult for them. So we had to reach out to others to, to help um, and the response was overwhelming. We had everything from uh, local footy clubs actually delivering hampers for us um, you know, commercial companies whose reps were off the road, they actually offered the services of those reps and their vehicles to help us, you know, deliver food to new places, people who were in lockdown and therefore couldn't come and get the food. Um, Rotary uh, service groups all dived in. It's amazing yeah. once you have a plan, how many people uh, uh, will step up and say, I will help you with that plan. Yeah. And I think also building networks with other professionals in other organizations. For example, last week we had a local hospital social worker um, working within a local hospital who contacted us because they knew that one of the services that we provide was actually food um, for clients. And they had a client who was being discharged and he was homeless. So they wanted to provide food vouchers and food uh, food packs for them. Mm -hmm. So they've linked, it wasn't our client, but we could work together like that to provide the resource for that service to provide to the client. So I think we need to be really aware of the networks that we can build with other professionals as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're probably going to have to wrap up soon, but I also wanted to just add neighbourhood houses and community mm -hmm. centres yes. are a yeah. great pick up drop off point. And there's also the Ask Izzy website, um, which yeah. you can actually go to and visit um, and, and search for a range of these different things. Um, yeah. And that's on the web page for this webinar. All right, so we might jump back into the practice guide now and look at one of the other FAQs that we um, that we tried to respond to. Um, and this is really around, I guess, working with people from different cultural backgrounds. So um, my clients can be from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and or from a range of overseas backgrounds, including people seeking asylum and refugees. So when I'm asking these, these screening questions of them, um, is there anything I should be aware of? Do I need to use any particular language? Um, and is there anything else to consider? So Margaret, I know you've done some work in culturally and linguistically diverse background um, communities. So did you want to um, answer that one first and then we'll see what Sarah and Sue um, want to add? 
Yeah. So although food, of course, is a universal need, so everybody needs food regardless um, their background. However, there are some um, backgrounds and different cultures that uh, for them food is um, is not just a food intake every day because the body needs it, but it's also around bringing the family together and having a social event and inviting extended family over and providing um, quite an abundance amount of food and they feel that there is that expectation that they need to meet as well so sometimes they might feel um, more embarrassed as well to say to their extended family that they do not have that food provision to to provide because it's not just about the daily needs but it's also meeting that social expectation and and the social event that is part of also the culture um uh, but in culture and the diverse and linguistically diverse communities um there's also the sensitivity of ensuring that the communication is actually not misleading and that they're actually understanding your point of where you're coming from where you're asking about food because it can be um you know in different in different cultures it's different so they might feel that that's something that they should not um open up to you um they might feel more comfortable to address it with a a person of um more that is more aware of their cultural background so we might need to maybe if we are working with somebody and we're not aware how our questions might impact or how we're going to address food insecurity because they're presenting it i think it's very important for us to seek um knowledge from expertise who work with with um, cult communities or with aboriginal communities who can give us tips on what the person what the client is presenting and what their actual need is um and how best to address it so we might need mm. to maybe address the client to a specialized service or else mm. just receive enough information for ourselves to understand presenting problem and and the surrounding issues as well in regards to the culture yeah yeah and, and I think also, I guess I would also just always encourage the use of interpreters um, and not always using and where possible and not using family members. Yeah, yeah, because we can't necessarily always guarantee yeah. the, the, the quality of the translation that's being done or whether there's um, a, they're answering um, truthfully because of the stigma that's attached with um, this, this kind of an issue. So Sarah, did you want to add anything to that one? I, I could just add that um, our 2019 research, um, we did some analysis around Indigenous communities and found that, um, not surprisingly, uh, very high levels of food insecurity, much higher than obviously um, uh, uh, general, the general Australian population, um, mm. and higher levels of psychological distress around that food insecurity than, than is the case um, elsewhere. Um, but one thing that is noteworthy is that a higher proportion of Indigenous people do seek food relief. Um, not to say that they're successful in getting it, but um, they're more likely to to actually seek help than than people in the cities, uh, mm. uh, uh, other areas. So just some observations. Mm. Yep. And Sue, so anything lastly to add? No, no, I think I really uh, concur with Margaret's point in terms of, you know, how that approach and, you know, that understanding of of the role that food has and that pressure of, you know, certainly in um, perhaps family celebration situations, it's, it's not like bringing a plate, it's potentially the expectation for that household to provide everything and the pressure that that um, mm. does put particular people under um, and and I think also in cultures of that that notion of within family of that sharing and what is what is mine is yours and what is yours is mine um, is mm. as well um, is yeah. important to note too yeah. I think it's important also to note that if we're working with cult communities we need to also be aware of their religious backgrounds um, and 
not offer foods which might actually be disrespectful to their practice. Mm. So yeah. we need to also be sensitive and do a little bit of a, a research about what we're actually yeah. offering them, not to actually yeah. disrespect their practices. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, um, yeah. Margaret, and comes back to that whole definition and consideration of how we respond in this situation that it is culturally appropriate foods that are being provided. Yeah. 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 And I guess I would just summarise that conversation by saying that, you know, by reminding people that are listening that we're not expecting, no one's expected to be, um, you know, a cultural expert or to be um, you know, an Aboriginal liaison or a liaison worker in enabled in in order to do this work well. And I think it's probably just um, there's probably some some cultural competence building um, that can be done quite easily um, by liaising with your local Aboriginal controlled um, community controlled organisation or working with um, the migrant research resource centres and um, that that are nearby. Um, or even reaching out more broadly um, beyond your local area, just to just to get a sense of what are the key things I need to know, so that I so that I can be confident to ask these questions sensitively. Um, yeah. I think the only other, the other question that's come through from the audience is just around, um, and on a similar note, the idea of um, food food insecurity in regions versus um, ma major cities. And I think Sarah touched on that before, but I was wondering, Sue, whether there's any research around, um, you know, rural and remote areas um, yeah. and the experience of food insecurity. Yeah, I think um, yeah, in answer to your question, yes, there there is, Mitch. Um, and certainly what there's that uh, ABS um, statistics highlight that those that live in regional and remote Australia um, may be experiencing food insecurity more perhaps than those in you know larger cities the reasoning may is certainly can be the same but you know there are some differences so if we think about Australia or a big quite you know country where you know there's aspects where there's you may live in one town that may not have a store where you can access food and you need to drive mm. two hours or more or to to the nearest food store um, to access food so there's there's that physical access to food and it's where the people actually have physically they have a car they you know can afford to put petrol in the car to you know to that sort of thing as well but then also we know the cost of food as well in regional and remote parts of the country is significantly greater as well so there's also mm -hmm. that that physical access the cost as well as um, statistically you know the the median income is potentially lower in mm. regional parts and and remote parts of the country than say living in um, you know major cities as well so it, there's mm. um, similarities but there's also some clear differences as well um, that add mm. to this complexity as well and and then certainly the response too yeah yeah. Yeah, Sarah, anything to add from the, the Food Bank um, hunger report work that you've done? Yes, yeah, so so another aspect of this is, uh, Sue's absolutely right, our research also shows that there's a higher level of food insecurity in in the country areas. Um, not surprising with, with, you know, recently with things like drought and then the black summer, um, just to, to add on top, um, the other thing is uh, people in the, the country experiencing food insecurity are more likely to experience stress, depression and shame. They're, you know, they're kind of, there's a, there's a pride there uh, uh, that when they're unable to support themselves, you know, really knocks them for six. Um, and uh, it, it does mean that it hits them psychologically harder than than perhaps their, uh, you know, their their fellow Australians in city areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and this is the sort of a last question and a closing question, and and that's really around. I mean, I guess touching on the fact that this is quite a layered, complex issue, um, and we've talked about financial hardship as kind of the key driver, but um, not the only driver, um, and that's important to note. So I guess, um, so I might start with you and then and hear um, what Margaret and Sarah have to say as well, but 
I guess the question in closing is, what does a solution look like? What, what's the answer to this really, really tricky um, problem to solve? Yeah. Well, there's probably a reason why it's called a wicked problem or a complex public health problem. And because there is no one simple solution. There's not one response that is, you know, one size fits all. Okay, as firstly, and that is really, as we've sort of highlighted through all of this, there is while financial resources is the, you know, one of the primary de determinants, we've got a whole range of other factors coming into play as well that provides that stress. So what we actually need is multi-strategy responses that range from a population kind of level, that is cross sectors. So by cross sectors, I mean that is bringing in, you know, health, education, um, employ, you know, employment, those, hot, you know, um, social, social assistance. So we're looking at that really kind of cross sector kind of policy based response okay, mm. that is going to have that population level impact. Then we can, if we then go down to the other end of the spectrum, is then what we've perhaps been touching on today is more of that individualised focus. But the reality uh, uh, with the individualised focus, while yes, it is really important, that that is not going to lift people out of the long-term experience of food insecurity, I think um, you know it's mm. it's um, it's like, and I think Sarah, you've mentioned it's like a band-aid, and I've heard I've got a colleague in the UK, and she talks about it's like putting the sticking plaster on the wound, you take it off, and it's still there. So you've kind of addressed it to a point but you haven't completely solved the issue. And then we've got that gamut in between, you know, across communities that we can have a range of responses at a community-based level with, you know, that's really, uh, again, multiple community partners across sectors um, that mm. really then, um, you know, address at that level. But we need, it's not a one size fits all. And what might fit in one community may be very different in another community. Um, as well as what we said, you know, what might fit in regional Australia may be very different to what fits within, you know, your larger cities. So I think um, that's the message there. It's about multiple responses that we need. And with that, to really try and help to drive that, we need to have a much better understanding of the scope and the magnitude of this is an issue and that comes down to having really really clear measurement and mm. not only clear measurement but um, one that's on a regular basis so you look at you know countries like the US where it's measured on an annual basis Canada every two years UK is now starting to do every year as well and we are stuck with like a three to four kind of yeah yep yep yeah Margaret or Sarah, anything to add to that? I, I just agree with everything that, that Sue has said. Um, and we do understand that you know, at, at Food Bank and other food relief organisations, we're just treating the symptoms. Um, and what we need to do is, is you know, take a, a more preventative health kind of a, a, a approach where um, people don't get the issue in the first place. Yeah, on a practice level, when we're meeting clients, rather than just putting the bandage on, as we're saying, um, but rather just exploring um, if they're coming with food insecurity, exploring the issue behind um, that presenting problem, what is causing the financial instability and the food insecurity, and because there might be things that we can actually provide solutions for. For there might be mismanagement of funds. There might be mental health issues, there might be addictions, there might be other things that we can help the clients to tap into, maybe um, linking to a job provider if they would like to um, maybe find a job, if they are struggling to find a job. You know, trying to understand a bit the what is causing the food insecurity mm -hmm. and trying uh, with the resources that we have, supporting the clients to actually come to a better place. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, and I would guess I would just say on my own reflection that um, I don't want to devalue the importance of the Band-Aid, I guess, and that, um, you know, and that based on what we've heard today from, from you all, um, the most resourceful people um, can still be, can still be, uh, can still encounter an unforeseen um, shock and, 
and that kind of episodic um, uh, food insecurity could hit any one of us at any point in time. So yeah. we, we could have the best systems in the world um, and the best population health um, approaches and public policy approaches, but we will always need people like Margaret at Gippsland Lakes Complete Health and, and we'll always need the food banks of the world to be there for people when, um, when they, they um, fall on hard times. Um, yeah. And I think it's, sorry, Mitch, I was just going to jump in um, as, as kind of a last point. I think it's really also important that we recognise that um, to, to really approach this from a strengths kind of based um, approach is that recognising that um, lots of people I, I talk to have these amazing levels of resilience as well as you know skills and assets and you know very creative in trying to make ends work, meet and as we've sort of all been saying it takes that kind of really ongoing kind of point or that one point that really puts that stress um, on you know mm. for that for that individual as well too. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um that's all we've got time for today. So I might um wrap it up there and thank you all once again for um yeah for your participation and sharing your incredible wisdom and knowledge. So thank you all. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Yes, thank and you. Each, yeah. Well, thank I've you learned great. a lot as well. So thank you, Sue and Sarah as well, because yeah. I really learned about from research and stuff. So thank you. <laughs>